I thought it would be in more. It was brilliant. Um, and I think there are going to be quite a lot of questions from the audience now. And we have, yeah, nearly 12 minutes. So uh, we can have some fun as so long as people keep their questions nice and short. And um, we'll go to number two. That looks like... Uh, you look like your Generation X. Oh no, that's probably being kind. Baby You're boomer, the light's not very Thank good. Thank you very much. I'm Generation Aussie. I've got three uh, millennials that uh, came from my marriage. Um, fantastic talk. <laughs> fantastic, uh, Eve. I, I loved every bit of it. My concern is uh, that the, the FAO and people who think about sort of the future of world poverty and food don't really get it. They're saying we've got a huge challenge to feed another three billion people who yeah. are largely going to be in areas where they've got no gardens, <clears throat> they're, they're living in slums or very high rise. How does the individuality and the need to grow our own and to sort of be, forgive me for saying, fairly elitist in our views, including mm -hmm. myself, how's that going to solve this problem of 2050 that we've talked about? Right, so I think one of the biggest misnomers is that we need to create, we need to grow more food in order to feed nine billion people. You don't. We throw away globally 30% of everything we produce. In the US, we throw out 40% of everything we produce. I mean, think about that, that's gotta hurt you. You work so hard to produce this food and people are trashing it, right? Or you have leftovers from whatever you've created that no one's buying from you, that are full of nutrition value, right? And so in the US, there's been a huge upsurge, I think it increased by 300% last year in the number of startups that are using wasted product. So there are ample opportunities to be creating nutrient-dense foods at a low cost, a super low cost, that either we can be eating here, I actually, there was a comment about hunger in the US, 46 million Americans don't know where their next meal is coming from. The idea that everyone in the US is not hungry is a total farce. <laughs> total farce, right? So we need to be feeding our own people with that. Um, there's also a lot of innovation. I know people probably hate Soylent, um, but there are a lot of technologies that are kind of taking the nutritional density, creating food at a low cost that's still gonna be not full of high fructose corn sugar. Uh, not full of soy and, and corn, because that's just not what people need to thrive, and we've, we've tested it. It's not going so well. Thank you. Have we got a millennial with a question now? Uh, <laughs> let's take this one. Uh, have we, can we get a microphone to the front <coughs> just here, please, to Catherine? Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Green from LEAF. How are we going to educate the next generation to equip them to cope in this kind of environment? Yeah. We talk a lot about engaging people with food and farming. That's part of it, yes. but that's only a very small part of this. Yeah. So where does education need to come? Really good question. So first of all, I do think that indoor growing systems are to become far more commonplace. So places like IKEA are working on that. So you'll have a cabinet where you go and grow your own herbs. And that might seem really small to you guys, but for a lot of people, that's pretty radical. Right, just the ability to see a seed grow into a plant to me, I'm not a deeply religious person. That, to me, like, is my God moment. It's totally astounding, right? But so to put that in someone's cabinet in their kitchen, that alone is going to be creating some kind of awareness. I also do think we're going to have to have a more localized food system, right? You guys are kind of being forced into it a little bit through Brexit, but I do think that just based on carbon footprint and based on a lot of different things, people are going to have to live closer to where food is produced, and so they're going to be more aware of it. There are also a number of education systems that are putting garden in, into classrooms. Right? So they're not saying you need to grow enough to feed yourself, but they are crafting math education, science education, even English literature right, around the garden and around that experience. And they're finding that to be incredibly useful um, for a lot of different reasons. Part of it is, is food education. A part of it's also kind of going to this point of making people feel empowered. There are a lot of youth today who feel pretty hopeless. Again, like the ability to plant a seed and cultivate something yourself is hugely impactful for people, especially at a young age. Thank you. Uh, another question. Whereabouts are the microphones? I've got, can you all stick the microphones up and then I'll try and make it easy for you. That's brilliant. Right, and the questions are, sorry, and hands up for questions. 
Uh, we've got one just here, yeah, let's take that one. Thank you. <laughs> On a similar line, how do we re-engage millennials in the GMO debate? So um, gene editing is potentially uh, the fast track to some of the needs that some of the foodies yeah. want, yeah. but we don't seem to be able to get that argument right. back on track. Right. So um, GM is incredibly frustrating, I understand, um, especially because people have very strong feelings about it but aren't terribly educated about it. Um, I think some of the good news is that GM is, I don't think it's going to be the big issue. I think it's going to be synthetic biology, um, right? You're kind of like taking a, a hop, skip, and a leap, right? Now people are really excited about CRISPR. Um, I think that what needs to be understood is that, so there's a lot of statistics these days and a lot of testing around trust. Again, I remember I told you that people's trust in business, in politics, in banking has plummeted. So the people who are most trusted are the military and scientists. So young people today are very open to science. It just needs to be presented in a way that doesn't seem like it's pandering, that doesn't, that's not funded by a big food company or a big agrochemical company. Um, so I do think that there is space for it, but I've often wondered, like, what would have happened if Golden Rice were the first GM to hit the market, right? Like, what if it was a genetically modified food that the everyday consumer would have benefited from? in a real way that they could understand. Um, so I do think that people are going to have to face the music. Obviously, in terms of climate change, we need GM crops to grow in certain regions. Um, but there also needs to be kind of a um, coming to terms with the reality of how we use GM today, and that it's not being used for the, I, in my personal opinion, and from a lot of people I've talked to, it's not being used in the way that I think it could be most effective. So it's going to be kind of shifting the GM marketplace and then educating the public in a way that's empathetic instead of saying, you stupid person, why don't you get it? Thank you. In, uh, if you were, uh, if you were um, brought up or being brought up on a farm in the UK, a small rural area mm. uh, of you know, a couple of hundred acres, what would you be doing with that yourself? Oh man, that's a really hard question. Of course it is. <clears throat> that's why we brought you here. Um. <laughs> I can do the easy ones. Okay, well, so first, I'm not a farmer, right? Um, I can tell you I would not be raising animals and I would not be growing corn or soy. So, I mean, we had this, this giant debate last night. I left feeling scared, not for the world, but honestly, I was a little concerned about you guys. Because you, you may feel really confident in what your family has been doing for the last 300 years, and that's fabulous, and you've been feeding people, and you've been doing a great job. But that's just not where society is heading. And you're going to have to make a new business plan for 20 years down the line, because your kids are not going to be farming the way that you're farming. Um, I would probably be focusing on, on grains, on legumes, um, root vegetables, things that you can't grow indoors, things that still have a high nutritional value, things that you can be growing um, in a crop rotation. Um, and then. I honestly think people should be looking and seeing what they can do with kind of these like high-end specialty crops and how much money you can make. So whether it's going to be flaxseed or quinoa, I know there's a lot of farmers in the States right now that are experimenting with quinoa. And you might have to do that through crossbreeding through GM, but the more you can specialize, the more you can make something that's an elevated version of something else, the more people are going to pay for it you're going to get a bigger bang for your buck. So that's probably what I'd be investing in. Brilliant. I'm uh, going to head up to number two and come back to number one microphone, please. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, Will Evans, uh, OFC, Emerging Leader Scholar and uh, host of Rock and Roll Farming podcast. Vance Crow, who is the head of Millennial Engagement at Monsanto in St. Louis, he talks a lot about tribes, if, yeah. if any of you follow him on, on Twitter. <clears throat> we, in this room as farmers, are one tribe, millennials are another. Uh, vegans are most definitely another. Yeah. The average age of a farmer in the UK is 59. How do we build bridges and increase levels of trust between these tribes to benefit us as primary food producers when it appears that we're so far apart? Right. So I have a really interesting job because I get to talk to people in all different areas. So I get to talk to foodies and to chefs and to farmers. And something that I've learned is that at the end of the day, everyone wants the same thing. Everyone wants to feed people, and they want to feed people nutritious food. Um, 
How do you start to make that connection? I would start to study what's happening in the states. So for the first time this year, the number of farmers under 35 increased. And those farmers, by and large, are coming from urban and suburban backgrounds. And they're college educated. So they're not, again, the paradigm is shifting, right? So the young people who are starting to farm are not inheriting their land. This is also causing a lot of other problems, right? Because it's incredibly expensive to start a farm. Right? They need to get the land, they need to get the equipment, they need to figure out what the heck they're doing, they're going to lose a lot of money in the first few years. Um, so part of it is government support systems. Part of it is like in the US, there's a new company that's, that's kind of like rent a tractor. Right? So it's using the sharing economy method, using technology in order to create a tribe of people who can rely on one another, who can learn from one another, but also kind of mitigate the costs of it. Um, I th also think it's about empowering people and taking, I mean, there's, there are, it's really hard to farm in the US organically. I mean, I think it's really hard to farm anywhere organically probably, but um, there's a lot that's working against farmers. You can be sued by large agrochemical companies. You're not getting subsidies. Um, the supply chain currently, the distribution systems are not set up for specialty crops in a lot of areas. Um, but so I think it's also working on finding other people who are working on those other parts of the value chain. Um, I know a lot of young people who are working on creating new distribution systems um, in the US, either by pairing up directly with um, big food companies or restaurants to have like an immediate buyer and a set buyer. Um, but then there's also different companies that are again using kind of sharing economy trucks that um, are refrigerating things and delivering them appropriately. Thank you. Um, we've got time for two quick questions uh, or one long one. Um, so we'll go with number one, please. Hi, Robert. Eve, we met last night and had a great chat about a number of things. Fantastic presentation. Uh, Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we, one of the things we touched on was millennials going offline, mm -hmm. which is the old new way of talking about talking to people. So, uh, um, but then they're not watching what we used to do when we used to talk to people or getting information as we used to in the old days when we spoke to people. Yeah. How's that going to work and play out for this industry in regards to communication? So they are now moving offline and then how will that work for people trying to sell products to them? Right, so a lot of, I mean, even if you look at trust right now, most people are getting their information, honestly, from bloggers who people like think are their friends or they're getting it from friends and family. And so it's gonna be a lot of word, word of mouth. I mean, I think that on kind of a basic scale, especially in urban settings, I think that food's gonna be grown far more locally. Like, I would not be surprised if every square mile of a city had their own indoor farm with their own indoor farmer who they can get to know and learn things from. I don't think the internet's going away, right? So, Internet advertising, content marketing, things of that nature are still going to be relevant, but I think it's going to be more experience-based. Probably brands are going to have to work a whole lot harder to show up where people are. Um, people are starting to go offline. There, there are a number of digital detox retreats. Um, and I think right now, it's, it's, it is having the effect of people e tribalizing even more, kind of shutting the world off. But I'm hoping there's a kind of a happy balance that's met at some point. Thank you. We'll go very quickly to number two. We're pushing our luck, I'm afraid. Thank you, um, David Linton. Um, you made the point earlier in your speech about uh, 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 <clears throat> in America, you know, the biggest, uh, uh, one of the biggest issues is obesity, is, and, uh, and the book Sapiens it refers to gunpowder is more safe than Coca-Cola in the United States. The type of uh, profile of millennial that you put up in terms of their eating habits, I think they may be doing that, but I think we're still washing it down with Coca-Cola. And as a reasonably successful conventional potato farmer, I think the type of people or the, or the sector that you've um, promoted or, or uh, profiled today, I think they're really hard to read. I think they're still too fickle. I think their, their habits could change again in another 10 years. Really quick so question, a, please. As a, potato, we'll slip as a conventional farmer, can you convince me to be more exotic? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, so first of all, there are plenty of people who are still drinking Coke. Um, again, millennial is overgeneralizing. A lot of the people who I was talking about today are people who are tech-strapped. They honestly could be 60 years old and, and exhibit this behavior. 
and be a millennial that lives in a rural area who doesn't care about Kim Kardashian and not fall into this category. Um, I, I would convince you simply by looking at human health and planetary health. Um, but also the opportunity really to feed people's needs. At least, I mean, I know the most about the US farming system. I know that we developed our current farming system because of a need during World War II. That need is gone. Right? I've met tons of farmers who have excess grain just sitting in silos. Right now, dairy farmers don't know what to do with their milk. Right? So the need has changed. And as a business person, I would optimize my business to meet the current needs. So I'd say, what can you grow that will make people feel safe, that they're in control, maybe can facilitate community of some kind, that a tribe can pick up and use your product and coalesce around? There's just new opportunities, and I would look at it that way. Brilliant. Eve, that was absolutely fantastic. Everything we hoped it would be. Um, and we could talk about this all day. Uh, and probably will carry on doing that over lunch. So uh, thank you very much. That's honoured uh, Frank Parkinson wonderfully. Thank you.